On this episode of Latinas, we'll learn about the El Salvadoran population of New York City, find out what we need to do to lessen our chances of developing breast cancer, say goodbye to dance icon Tina Ramirez, and so much more. Latinas starts now. Welcome to Latinas, the show that celebrates Fosas Mujeres in the Latinx community. I'm Tina Beth Pina. Today, I'm at Greenwood Cemetery, a national historic landmark in Brooklyn with over a half a million graves on more than 400 acres. It memorializes the dead while simultaneously bringing to life the art, history, and natural beauty of New York City. Every year, Greenwood celebrates the rich history associated with the Mexican holiday, Dia de los Muertos, also known as the Day of the Dead. The holiday, which is traditionally celebrated on November 1st and 2nd, honors a loved one who has passed. Yvette Marquez Sharpnack from Muy Bueno explains how to build a Day of the Dead altar in your home to remember those who are no longer with us. Dia de los Muertos is the tradition of honoring departed loved ones. On Day of the Dead, we don't celebrate death, we celebrate life. We invite their souls to come and visit us. Home altars can be set up to honor and guide loved ones through their spiritual journey. Marigolds are a traditional flower for Dia de los Muertos. Their bright color and strong aroma are believed to help lure spirits. Lighting candles on your altar will shine their light and guide souls to the altar. Dia de los Muertos is not just about celebrating family, it's also about eating delicious food and placing ancestors' favorite meals on your altar as offerings. If you'd like, you can also place religious statues. Colorful skulls represent the spirits being honored and symbolize the cycle of life and death. Be sure to display photos as well as personal objects to honor your departed loved ones. Rather than being viewed as a sad holiday, Dia de los Muertos is a time of celebration. It is believed the dead awaken and visit their living families to celebrate the lives they lived. Salvadoran population in New York is very small, and that might be the reason why there isn't enough research or documentation about their presence here. Correspondent Marlene Peralta spoke to a Salvadoran journalist who is helping to change that with her own research and books. We traveled to Queens to meet journalist and author Carmen Molina Tamacas to talk about her book, Salvi Yorkers. Tell us why we're here at this restaurant, and because it's uh, one of the, the pioneers from Salvadorian business in New York. They started back in 1980. The story of Rincón Salvadoreño restaurant is among countless of stories Molina Tamacas features in her book in her attempt to trace the origins of Salvadoran migration to New York. When I immigrated, I started from zero, as all of us and start building my network of contacts. I was a correspondent for a major newspaper in El Salvador, and then I started writing for El Diario New York, the Hispanic newspaper, and I found the lack of documentation about the Salvadoran or even the Central American community, specifically in New York. For her book, Molina Tamacas went beyond to chronicle stories of arrivals in the 1960s, but later had to update her book after finding a Salvadoran family that arrived as far back as the 1920s. In the 50s, this is a story for me, is the most inspirational of, of those, is Mrs. Katy Andrade. She just passed away one year ago, and she was the director from the Department of Education from one of the biggest unions from the garment industry. 
and she was uh, fighting for civil rights in the 60s, but also with the help of another journalist, Latina researcher, Maria Barrera, she helped me and we found a Salvadoran Italian family that came in Labor Day, September 2nd, 1929. So, and for us it's like, wow, so this was happening. There are about two and a half million Salvadorans in the United States. In New York City, they are a minority among Latinos, being the seventh largest Latino group in the city. The majority of New York State, however, live on Long Island. We went to the Center for Latin American, Caribbean, and Latino Studies at CUNY to ask an expert about why there is not enough information about Salvadorans in New York. I think it's not specifically about Salvadorans. I think it's, uh, it's an issue of the way that, for example, the U.S. understood the Latino population or the Latin American population. There's a lot of debates on how to classify us, if we were a race and ethnicity, how we pick all those boxes that we have in all these official documents. So there's a question of they don't know what to do with us, right? Uh, they don't know how, in what box to put us. Here's what we know about Salvadorans based on his research. The median household income of Salvadorans in the New York metro area is also very high compared to the other Latino nationalities. I think it's around $89,000 a year. Very closely, it's Colombians. It's also $89,000 and some change. Uh, but for example, Mexicans and Dominicans have much lower um, house, median household incomes, around $60,000, $65,000. Molina Tamacas highlights that Salvi Yorkers is not a history book, but one that can help younger generations learn about their origins in New York. It's because what mainstream tell us about Salvadorans is related to gangs, violence, or natural disasters uh, that they are always happening. And I found very important to fill that void and it's the way I want to return to my country, to my people. For Latinas, I am Marlene Peralta. Gender in our day and age is fluid. We may physically appear one way, but identify another way. Trans men, Dadrian, Danny, and Julian are back to explore how confusing it can be for everyone to understand the difference between sex and gender in today's Caliente Caliente. Sometimes you have issues with your sexuality. You have to come out to your parents saying you feel like you like the opposite gender or whatever the case is. Yeah. And sometimes you have issues with your gender identity and then yeah. you have to tell them, I don't feel comfortable with the gender I was born with. I don't know what to tell you. I don't know why I feel this way, that also but I do. That also makes things complicated right. too with the whole sexuality and gender. 100%. It is complicated. Yeah. <laughs> it's very, yeah, we are complex humans. I'm a lesbian. Yeah, yeah. and <laughs> like, like, like my family what? and my mom, they assume that I was a lesbian and I'm yeah. like, the whole time Time, I'm like, no, nah, I like men. And I think that confused a lot of people. It's like, they, they still forget that, like, yes, I'm transi transitioning into a man and I like men. Do you feel and like you label yourself as a gay man? Literally, like, yeah. I identify as a gay yeah. man, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And it confuses a lot of people because they assume, oh, if you wanna be a man, you also gotta like women. Yeah. And it's like, are you guys forgetting about gay men? Yeah. Like, what? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, they exist. <laughs> right, right. That's true. <laughs> That's why I said it's like two different things. People, the, the moment you tell them about your gender, right, they assume that you're just straight now. Yeah. Yeah. Like, nope. No, my sister still thinks I'm a lesbian. And then when I tell her, because she's like, do you like guys? I'm like, I don't know. I guess Sometimes. my sexuality <laughs> and my gender is so fluid. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, this yeah. is why I don't even feel like I fit in the trans man community a lot yeah. of the times. And I always get, like, heat for it. Because, like, yes, like I said, non-binary, but I use he, him pronouns, right? Mm -hmm. I'm preferred he, him. I don't mind they, them, mm -hmm. but yeah. my preferred is he, him. That's why, like, labels can be so toxic sometimes. It can be. It's like, people just, everything's all a label, but a yeah. lot of us don't want labels. Yeah, I just, just want to exist. I just want to yeah. just, yeah, yeah. I want to, like, live like be a unicorn. Yeah. Like, be Same rare. <laughs> like, I just want to be different. Like, I want to be rare. I don't yeah, care I what it is. If but you are rare. That's what I'm saying. Exactly. We are all unicorns. Yeah. In, yeah. in your are. case, we are individually very unique, very yeah. different. Like, I don't know. I feel the same way, though. Like, it, that confused me, too, because growing up, I did, like, uh, date men before and stuff yeah. like that. And I had my instances where I was, like, bisexual for a while, you know. And mm -hmm. 
I, that's why I don't like tell people like, oh, what are you then? I'm like, I'm just queer. <laughs> I don't yeah. know what to do. But I like, like that. I live too. in the yeah, rainbow. Yeah, like, same. I'm just queer. I say queer, and then yeah. they're like, so you're gay? I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing is, like, a lot of people because of how I like express myself, I come off more as a gay guy, right? Mm. Or like how I dress, or like whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm like, no. My mom would go, I, yeah, yeah, you're confusing me. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's what my sister said too. She's yeah. like, "You're so confusing," and I'm like, "But yeah. you're you're not dating me. You don't have to know. Like, yeah. Yeah. You're not dating me. I'm not dating you. I'm you're not in my position, and I'm just like I'm just living. I'm living. I'm happy. Like Facts. I'm just living. That's what it comes down to. You know, people assume that you're not happy because a lot of the time they think you're not happy, so that's why you're doing all these things, and mm -hmm. or you're confused. That's why you're doing all these things. Mm -hmm. right. But at the end of the day, it's like we're we're all pushing to one one thing, right? Which is Find we're seeking happiness, happiness. Yep. and that's what it comes down to. We'll dive even deeper one last time into their lives next month when they talk about the complex world of relationships. Stay tuned. Dance innovator Tina Ramirez was an artist and activist who is best known as the founder and artistic director of Ballet Hispanico, the premier Latino dance organization in the United States. Ramirez was born in Venezuela, the daughter of a Mexican bullfighter and grandniece to a Puerto Rican educator who founded the island's first secular school for girls. The Ramirez family moved to New York City when Tina was around six years old and she became a young dance student at a time when the worlds of ballet, modern dance and ethnic dance were largely separate. She trained and performed rigorously until 1963 when she conceived and directed an intensive training dance program for younger students called Operation High Hopes. Encouraged by the growing skill of her pupils and increasing requests for performances, Ramirez formally established Ballet Hispanico in 1970 to include a company, a school, and educational programs. Tina Ramirez served as its artistic director until 2009, and for over 50 years, Ballet Hispanico has continued to provide a haven for underserved youth and a catalyst for social change. In recognition of her enduring contributions to the field of dance, Ms. Ramirez received several awards, including the National Medal of Arts, the nation's highest cultural honor. Ramirez was a true visionary, a passionate and tireless cultural and artistic leader who was way ahead of her time. She built a company from community roots into a world-renowned treasure, with education always at the core of her mission. She gave the gift of dance and Latino culture to generations. Ramirez passed away peacefully last month at 92 years of age. The dance icon's legacy lives on, not only in the extraordinary gift that she left the world, but in each and every person she touched and inspired. Tina Ramirez is today's Badass Latina. Did you know that there's now a Black and Latino Studies major at Baruch College? The innovative degree track is breaking new ground in the approach to race and ethnic studies. Let's take a look. We are super duper excited because Baruch College is about to have a Black and Latino Studies major. That major is interdisciplinary, which means that students get a chance to study quantitative and qualitative methods of analysis and research that celebrates and centers the knowledge production by Black and Latinx peoples from across the globe. A BLS major is really useful in that it's interdisciplinary, and that means that a student in a class gets to study not just literature, but literature in the context of history, or political theory in the context of sociology, or economic history, or economics in the context of, say, I don't know, poetry. This gives a student a chance to kind of think broadly and across disciplines so that they have all kinds of tools that are legible in their careers beyond college. It's the future. The future is being able to think about complex ideas with complex lenses of analysis, which prepares the student to do law, to study law, it prepares the student to go on to graduate school, to become a professor. It prepares the person to pursue a career in education, public policy, social work, social justice, racial justice. And we know that those two things cross the borders of professions, careers, and all kinds of ambitions, because we all want the world to be a better place, right? Right. Just in time for Halloween, we're about to meet Skeletina, a 
fun-loving, fearless little girl who lives in the in-between world with her friends. The book's author and illustrator, Susie Jaramillo, is about to tell us how Skeletina helps kids cope with their anxieties. I think that nightmares are something that aren't really talked about enough. And I feel like presenting nightmares in a book and acknowledging them and these creatures that are behind them and having this character called Skeletina who's in this world, who's dealing with these creatures and who's helping children sort of like de-escalate these fears and kind of blow them away and doing so with humor and with creativity and giving kids sort of techniques to deal with these fears, I think is, is really important for children. I, I think that you know, children have a lot of darkness in their lives sometimes and it manifests themselves in their nightmares and I think it's important to acknowledge this and to help find ways to help them deal with it. Ideally, with humor, with love, with compassion, and with creativity. She's so special because she's the friend that I wanted to be in my dreams, to talk some sense into me, and to help me, you know, dispel the fears, whether it was like my teeth were falling out, or whether it was that dream that like everything is like shaking and I'm in an earthquake, or the constant dream, this one I had a lot, which is like that dream that I'm drowning. Right? And I'm constantly trying to like swim and save other people. And the more I swim, the more I'm drowning, right? And so Skeletina would have told me, no, just, just breathe and you can breathe underwater and then you can fly. Because in the in-between world, anything is possible. And I feel like it's those kinds of notions that kids need to hear more um, to guide them in their dreams so that they can use their dreams as just a place of pure creativity and imagination and a place where anything's possible and they're in control. October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month and according to the American Cancer Association, Latinas are diagnosed at more advanced stages of breast cancer and are about 30% more likely to die from it. Dr. Stephanie Martinez from Union Community Health Center is here to tell us what we need to do to lessen our chances of developing breast cancer in today's Medical Minute. In America, there are currently more than 3.8 million women who have been diagnosed with breast cancer. And the average American woman has a one in eight chance of developing it. So if you see or notice new lumps in the breast or underarm, thickening or swelling of any part of the breast, irritation or dimpling of the breast skin, and redness or flaky skin in the nipple area or the breast, you should definitely see your doctor. It's important to also do frequent self-breast exams and talk to your doctor about any concern. There are treatments for breast cancer depending on the stage, and they may consist of chemotherapy, radiation, and even surgery. But some tips that are linked to lowering the risk of breast cancer include being physically active, achieving and maintaining a healthy weight, limiting alcohol, eating fruits and vegetables, and not smoking. These lifestyle tips and routine self-exams, as well as your annual mammogram, should help minimize your chances of developing advanced stage breast cancer. For Latinas, I'm Dr. Stephanie Martinez. There's a hidden gem on the Queens College campus called the Godwin Turnback Museum that houses the only comprehensive collection of art and artifacts in Queens. And it just happens to be co-directed by Maria Pio, a Latina who grew up in the borough. Correspondent Elena Romero has that story. I was born in uh, Quito, Ecuador, and I came here with my family when I was eight years old. Um, we moved and we've lived in Queens, and I actually attended Queens College, so I'm a graduate of Queens College where I received my bachelor's uh, in art history. And as I was taking art history classes, I wanted to know more about museums in general, but I wanted to know a little bit more about uh, this museum and sort of what it had to offer in many ways. And I was lucky enough to get an internship working with the collections manager at that time, and that's what led me to pursue a master's degree in art history and later um, another masters in education and museum leadership. The Godwin Turnback Museum is a teaching museum. The collection is open to students, faculty, and staff to do research and in many cases to handle art objects. When I bring my students here to the museum, I bring it as, as a capstone moment. So it's at the end of the semester that we arrive and curators set up tables with 
artifacts related to the course. So they are encouraged, actually, they've been encouraged to touch and handle the materials because it's a teaching collection. And I think as ordinary as that sounds, right, it sounds like a very mundane thing, but it's a very extraordinary engagement with artifacts that are often a thousand years old or more. For me, it's enchanting to see just how disarmed they are by proximity to the past, right? The museum offers all types of educational programming, including artist talks, curator talks, gallery conversations, family workshops, and kindergarten through 12th grade school visits. With kindergarten through 12th grade schools, um, I've started to foster some relationships with local schools here around the, the Flushing area community. I've gotten to get to know some principals, system principals, and teachers, and thinking of ways that we can sort of collaborate together to bring students into our space and ways in what they're studying in their units. I admit that I find this space very inspiring actually, and very relaxing at the same time. So it does have a bit of a cathedral quality for me. And I think in such a busy city and, and in, with such a harried schedule, um, it, is a, you know, it is certainly a blessing to have a space like this. And still, with such impressive opportunities for learning and experimenting, the museum also faces some challenges. So I think one of the challenges that we face um, at the Godwin Turnback um, would be visibility and awareness that we are a museum within a college. Not many people know that we exist. And I think, you know, creating awareness that we are here, we're open to students, faculty, staff, but also the public to come and visit, to view our exhibitions, to attend our programs. Most of our exhibitions, if not all, are in, and programs are free of charge. So it's really a great opportunity for anyone that's in the area or if you want to take a bus ride, a train ride, come and visit us. Once you get here, your visit is free. So the next time you're in the area near Queens College, consider visiting the Godwin Turnback Museum. Maria Pio would be delighted to have you here. For Latinas, I'm Elena Romero. Alyssa Crespo is a trans Latina advocate who has been fighting to promote civic engagement and elevate the LGBTQ's community's voice in halls of power. She's currently the executive director of the New Pride Agenda, and that's why Alyssa Crespo is today's Latina on the Rise. My childhood was fine. I was always able to go home and, and be myself. While I've struggled a lot, one of those things is not uh, rejection, abandonment, or homelessness. I was raised by a group of strong women, and I think that that is sort of a part of being a Latina, that is a part of our identity as women, as being tough. And I think it's a good reputation, and I think that certainly helped me in my career. I am the executive director of the New Pride Agenda, which is a statewide LGBT advocacy and education nonprofit. So I got involved in advocacy in 2015. I was really radicalized, like a lot of young people were. It was that period that made me want to go back to school. I enrolled in, in John Jay and started to study political science, and I took a Latino studies class. I learned a lot about my identity and who I am as a Puerto Rican woman. The picture became more clear that I was in fact a multiracial person. I knew that 2021 was going to be a very important year for local politics in the city of New York. And I saw it as an opportunity to jumpstart a career in politics. And there certainly were moments where my past was brought up in the press. You know, I'm a former sex worker, as many trans Latinas are or have been. That was also something that I wasn't hiding, that I was transparent about, but of course I wasn't screaming it from the top of my lungs. And I just didn't know what to expect. I didn't know if I would knock on the wrong door and something bad could happen. I think it's really important for trans people to be involved in politics. When we look at the numbers, it tells us that one in three trans people will be diagnosed with HIV. It tells us that trans people have one of the highest rates of suicide ideation. It tells us that one out of every two black trans women will experience incarceration. One of the most traumatic experiences of my life was inside of a county jail in Jacksonville, Florida 
where I was housed with cisgender men and um, I had to call my mother and I had to tell my family some really deeply personal things that I had not fully accepted about myself at that time. It certainly was the challenging and traumatic and difficult times for me because I had a home, I had, you know, a family, and yet I still fell into some of those traps and cracks that we do. And so that was a yeah, very difficult moment for me. And I think opposite, one of the things I'm most proud about in my tenure as executive director is that we uh, fought relentlessly to create um, a transgender wellness and equity fund. We got to name it in honor of Lorena Borjas, who was a um, trailblazer and leader who um, helped organize the trans Latina community and the immigrant trans community in Jackson Heights, Queens, um, and something I'm really proud of. Um, yeah. And that's our show for today. For more information on what you just saw, check out our website at tv.cuny.edu and follow our social media profiles. We love sharing our Latina stories with you. And please make sure you tune in next month. We'll meet the Latina head chef at Choco Bar, learn what we need to do to lessen our chances of developing diabetes, and so much more. Uefa! Hasta la próxima. Bye-bye.